Sneaky, you are a super successful streamer and cosplayer now. What would it take for you to come back and be a pro again? Um, I, I said it before, it's kind of just like the, the right team um, in the right situation. It's just, I wanted to be with players that I saw something in or knew that I could work with. It's, it's not like I couldn't work with people, right? But just basically the right people in the right time, um, which is hard to find. I'm also pretty comfortable doing my own thing too. And it's been fun chilling with Medios a lot as well, doing the co-stream. So it, it's always potential. Cool. So we got Medios, Jungle, Sneaky AD, Double lift, off roll, something. We need two more. <laughs> we, we tried that <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, we got Rick Fox <laughs> to get carried. <laughs> All right, let's do it. I've been looking for a carry my whole life. Okay. <laughs> do, don't you play bot lane too? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I call it play bot lane. <laughs> I show up in bot lane <laughs> and then like my support usually just leaves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more because I of my play than because of the kind of you know the current meta. But <laughs> yeah, the meta. <laughs> <laughs> I blame it on the meta. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> they probably blame it on the fact. I die like in the first two minutes, <laughs> three minutes, you know. Yeah. Go, Crit Hill, sound like they my mind, you. Type of car we don't steal. Backseat driver for real. Drop me off at the top. Got that key with no lock. Play for the team that I own. Ain't no taking my spot. Franchise, franchise, we take a lifetime to spin. Hit that bank to the visit. Raise a hand if you win. Drop the top on the rose. Had a holy to go. I actually want to know what you've been up to. Have you been following League? I I follow it not as consistently as I used to. Yeah. Because it still burns a little bit. Um, being in here though feels great. Mm -hmm. Being in this building feels great. Um, rush of uh, memories come flooding in, which is great. I drive this street a lot. Mm -hmm. So I don't, See the I don't drive by. Yeah, I don't drive by and not slow down. But I do know that it's you know. Things are, are wrapping up here, and worlds are around the corner. I do, I do keep a pulse on it, and I do have this. Uh, I wouldn't call it a fantasy. I do have this dream of of um, experiencing all of this again. Mm -hmm. I can. Feel I that. would love that. And yeah. Yeah, Echo Fox was a good time. It was fun following you, you know, seeing you up there. We were like, <laughs> we were a little everything, weren't we? Um, I was learning how to not only <clears throat> be a. a a startup in a business in sports, having come from sports, I felt comfortable about that. You know, I felt comfortable being in a sports environment, but learning how to uh, really take a group of men in and a, a staff in and shape and build something special that can compete on the level that you guys are used to seeing here for so many years was, was an amazing journey, but challenging. Um, we got it right sometimes, we got it really wrong other times. Sure. Uh, but from that, I think, uh, I always equate it to my years in Boston, not to slight the Celtics, but I had six horrible, you know, learning uh, <laughs> years there. We didn't win anything, we didn't, you know, we didn't do anything successful. But then I got to L.A. and uh, won three championships. So, mm -hmm. so you, the things you learn in, in a failing situation can inform you for the future. Mm. Of those three championships, is there one that stands out the most? Yes, uh, there's uh, the, the second one. We got it right on a, whether you're spiritual or not, we got it right on a spiritual level. Mm. Um, the, the basketball gods were, we honored them by the way we interacted with each other, the way we competed. Um, was that the year you were 16-1 in the playoffs? Yeah, yeah, yeah man, that, and that one was, we had two weeks off, but we were so, we were killing everybody yeah. to the point that we had two weeks <laughs> off before the finals, okay. and so we we got a little got a little stiff. Rigor mortis kind of set in, and so to, to start that engine again, uh, when the Sixers came in, it just they got us, and we yeah. almost caught them. Even in that game, yeah, yeah, there was a few shots that just didn't quite fall, and it would have been it would have been sweep. a perfect season. My it goodness. would have been a perfect uh, run to a championship. So that was probably my most memorable one, yeah, uh, and and so much so that. The next year when we started the season, the feeling I had had dissipated from that run and it was unsettling. Like it was like I'd lost something. And, and when, you, when you experience something, I'm sure you guys have had, when you experience that purity on a level that's just euphoric and you just understand that the game can't be played any better than this, mm. then there's just like <laughs> a longing for it for the rest of your life. <laughs> like I've had that ever since. Yeah, I, I, th I think that feeling is why like it's the thing that draws me to league especially competitive and um i don't know if i'll play competitive again but like 
I'm sure you know it, Sneaky, like that feeling when everything's just working, you know, like mm -hmm. everyone's seeing the game the same way. Uh, everyone's like in this flow state where, you know, everything just falls together. It's, I don't know, you can't beat that. No. When you retired as a player, you went on to be like a movie star and you've mm. done all these different things. How did you think about like your transitions and like what did you want to, how did you know what you wanted to do next? The, after you um, the, the thud that happens, the, the thud that happens in retirement or the end when the end is there and you know it. And in the case of, for me, it's usually injuries for all of us, right? Injuries start creeping in and things start breaking and, and you can make a decision of I'm going to push my body further or am I going to protect it? for the rest of my life, right? And I left the game and it was hard. I, I'll never forget we lost to the Detroit Pistons and I knew my career was over in the showers of that arena and the palace at, in Auburn Hills, I'll never forget. And we were flying back to LA and they were doing exit interviews. They were, they were like trying to schedule the exit interviews for the next few days. And I told uh, the trainer, I said, look, if, you want, if Phil wants to do an exit interview with me, he needs to do it like right as I get off this plane because I'm done. I knew it was over. And Phil and I sat in the car um, outside the airport there, and he voiced, he said, you know what, I think you should be a coach. I think you should stay and coach. I think you'd make a great coach. And in that moment, for me, the game ha had brought so much joy, so much pain physically, and so much emotional pain in that loss, that losing moment. Saying goodbye for the to the game, I wanted to get away from it as far as, as, much, as, far as I could and as fast as I could because I, I was hurting. Mm. Physically and emotionally, I was hurting. Um, but the game has given me so much um, that I knew, I knew I had this parallel track of, for me, wanting to be a, a, uh, in a group dynamic. So TV and movies on set give me a group dynamic. I knew through my sports I expressed myself physically. Um, and the TV and entertainment industry allowed me to express myself again. Mm. Um, both of those careers allow me to serve my teammates serve a character that I'm playing, serve teammates, and, and tell a story. A, a journey of a LCS season or an NBA season is a journey and a story, right? You go on a ride, mm. right? You watch a TV show or movie, you go on a ride with those characters. And so for me, those, that, those parallel tracks worked. Um, coming back to sports through the LCS and eSports just remind me everything that I love about um, competition. Um, competition for me, was a pilot light that was lit on a, an Atari 2600 back as a 12 year old in the Bahamas. Mm. I've played games my entire life. I was streaming last night. A person goes, man, you worth all this money. What are you doing playing games and streaming? And I go, it's, I said, it's what I've been doing. It's, what I do. <laughs> it's fun. I'll do it on my deathbed. Yeah. You know, it's what I do. So the gift of being in this community has been, and being in esports has been the reigniting of all of that that I've been and that I love. So I wouldn't be an NBA player had I not fallen in love with competition, mm -hmm. playing games. Yeah. Now I'm making games. So it's like that thing of I can't, I'll never get away from them because it's where I find the most joy. What kind of game? I can't tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm allowed to, I would, I'd love to. The world it's coming, right it's coming, here. it's coming. No, 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 we'll, 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 maybe we'll do that next. Maybe we'll do that next. Next, next level. No, it's, uh, oh. but it's. Looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, also through the community here, my son has found his way. You know, he, he looked up to you guys, had a dream of, of having a life and, and a career in the industry, and he's found that. And that's great. He's, he's, and so that's, that's, what this, that's what this journey will always be for me, and it's why I stay so close to it. And I awesome. love it so much. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you gotta know it's sweet. Sometimes you gotta know it hit. Sometimes you got a big time like a 9-9 for the 2000 to roll with it. I put my name on the map. I made a moment of that. I took the ball, better my coat. I know they won't it bad, bad. We were talking earlier and we decided to try and save the conversation until you were here about, um, I was trying to explain to him like what I learned as a, like a fan about Kobe, Shaq, mm -hmm. and then also all these other NBA duos like Kyrie and LeBron and how there's this like, oh, this is LeBron's team. Oh, when, right. when Durant was on the Warriors, it was still Steph's team, yeah, yeah. right? And then Medios was saying, in league, like maybe it should be more like that. Like what if there's just like this leader on a team, but there's, this is what I kind of wanted to talk about. In basketball, there's a ball, <laughs> right? Right, right? So right. like LeBron can run an offense and Russell Westbrook can run an offense and their usage rates are like through the charts. It's like, oh yeah, they have the ball 40% of the time. Right. I don't know, where's that possibility in league of it being so 
hugely teamwork oriented. And I want to get like your opinion on this too, Sneaky, versus basketball, where I think it is a little more possible to actually carry a team yeah. as an individual. Well, I think the pressure, I'm sure you can speak to a Sneaky, has been to carry the team at times, right? And the pressure of actually shouldering the responsibility of the wins and losses from a front-facing uh, conversation and yeah, interviews that afterwards. You can, you can do that yeah. from a branding and marketing side point, like uh, Jack marketing C9 around Sneaky. Like these things are are, are great because it's a connection and, and language that the fans can then grab onto, hold on to, and celebrate his excellence, celebrate then the flag of C9 as, as being this org that is excellent. All of this stuff, I, I think, to your point, needs a front-facing leader. And then the players are now, I believe, should be celebrated and pushed to the front. Mm -hmm. It should be a, a Medios team, a sneaky team. It should be the players, because um, we've seen it in basketball, we've seen it in other sports, right? Yeah. In my era in the NBA, in the 90s, it was Michael Jordan, it was Charles Barkley, it was Larry Bird, it was Patrick Ewing. Like mm -hmm. you had stars and the league rose because you had these stars mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. came to see those players. Those it's players. a little bit why I, I, um, I anointed Frog in that for us when mm. we first came in. I knew we needed a, a player of that caliber for, for fans that were new to Echo Fox to look at us and go, I see what you guys are about, Yeah. right? This is what you guys are about. So this is really interesting because it feels like we're talking a bit about the brand of a player as being sort of representative of that's their team yeah. as opposed to in-game leadership. So I'm curious, Sneaky, as someone who was on a team with High where from the outside looking in, like he was an in-game leader, but yeah. also then being the most veteran Cloud9 member after, mm -hmm. did it at any point feel like this is someone's team? Um, so I think there's like two parts to the equation because you're comparing it to like the ball and like how you can have it like 40% of the time. Yeah. Because um, obviously like in-game there's the similarity in gold allocation. There's still farm. There's yeah. Still yeah. So like there you go. You can yeah. kind of, I mean, like you did it. You did it with like Uzi too. Like yeah. he just takes everything, or like you can <laughs> give it to him. So there's there's in game options for that. Um, but then out of game too, like you're asking about like high, like high was definitely like uh, our leader, and like ever since he left, um, maybe not initially, but like I don't know, ever since 2015, 2016, like I, I was kind of definitely like the person that stuck around. So. Mm -hmm. Like, I eventually moved into a leadership role. And it's not just, like, uh, I'm making calls all the time. Like, I'm, I wasn't the same as High, where I'm, like, the commander, the the guy who's controlling every piece. It's, like, mm -hmm. it's more of uh, my opinion in-game and out-of-game. A lot of out-of-game, honestly, uh, was kind of just respected more and, like, seen as, like, you know, if I say something, they're really confident in what I say and like they respect what I say so the things that I do say matter a lot more than you know someone else but even though like say I, I think like like licorice and me got into an argu argument one time for example oh do tell yeah <laughs> well like it was when minions were different like bot lane was getting pushed in it was like mm -hmm. near our tier three and we hadn't getting, gotten farm for like the last five minutes yeah. so I made the call for Niski to go bot and then licorice had the other call uh that he wanted Nitsuki to just keep grouping because he thinks we could just end the game. But like, because I was around much longer and like it's, I'm like the leadership position. Like, I made the call. Like, no, just just go bot Nitsuki. Just just do it. And then like, uh, Licorice got like a little mad about it, and like we talked about it afterwards. Uh, and like he was still mad about it after. But it's like, you know, you get into those discussions where like, basically my voice mattered more in the moment and my voice mattered after. And it's like, I, I can still come to terms and be like, yeah, I think, you know, maybe he could have just grouped and it's fine. But, it, you know, it's just an example of how when we get into those kinds of talks, it's like because of how long I've been around the team and it's like I didn't really consider it my team, but, you know, it kind of just happened that way. Yeah. Uh, then those kinds of things happen where your voice matters than another one. And, you know, you can kind of lead the team in that way. Is there like a communication hierarchy? So yeah. for instance, on uh, on like TL or something, uh, Core is the main shot caller, but yeah. then Alfari does a lot of the other driving. But if like they have a split call, you instead of trying to figure out what it is you in the moment, just you core. just say, follow this guy. Yeah, right? yeah. There, there definitely wasn't a lot of that, but it's kind of hard to allocate that like preemptively besides just 
being more confident in the other guy. We tried for years. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we it's tried so hard. for years. Like, How did you... was, we never got that right. Yeah. Like every yeah. every season, every split, it was a uh, okay, who's our shot caller? Like who's yeah. the shot caller? Like, and is it is it is it early game, late game? Is it switching? Is someone mm-hmm. carrying us home at the end? Is it should it be our star player? Because, because it also depends on who has the gold in that game and what the team <laughs> comp is and if they're on an engaged champion. Yes. And there's so many yep. unique variables. And I found that happen. I found some of the people that we wanted to have a voice, regardless through the course of the game, so many times it was their confidence level dipped if they weren't having a good game. Yes. If, they're, if they didn't have the goal, if they didn't, if they, or in some cases, if they got killed in the first eight minutes. It was like, that was it. <laughs> Shut down. It's over. Yeah. Going, now we have no shot caller. <laughs> that that like, was high th- so yeah, that, that, I was going to say, that is high to a T, because <laughs> we would pretty much live and die by high, and <laughs> high in scrims was was an animal like there's no other way to say it like he's the kind of dude who like especially when he was against reggie so when reggie was on tsm and they scrimmed i shit you not every single game one of them would die at level one they would just fight each other to the death didn't matter the champion didn't matter anything else that one of them would die level one and i'm just like if high was the one who died then he would be like you know quiet the whole game he'd be like tilted he'd be mad he'd be like oh man like i hate this guy that kind of thing and so then it's like we wouldn't have that Leadership, but then other games where he's doing really well, it would be super easy to follow him because it's just like, you know, he can do whatever he wants to do. But I think that idea of having a shot caller is something that a lot of teams have struggled with. And I think kind of what you were saying on C9, Sneaky, is because I think in our original team, I never thought of it as like, you know, we ever had a dis- we ever had like a full on discussion about like okay you know if multiple make a call we're gonna follow this one and then this one and then this one like highs or shot caller it just was more organic than that it was yeah. just kind of like the natural chemistry of our players yeah is you know we trusted high because I mean he was super loud for one and it was just like easy to get behind him I think we we're also like a team of people who are like pretty good at following right like mm-hmm. I think you and balls were always just like. Soldiers like just down for whatever. It's just yep. like if a call is made, you're just like, yep, I'm down. <laughs> that, that's key. That's the chemistry. I'm curious to go back to one thing about just like having miracle runs or like spe- when you're playing at a spiritual level. Yeah. Um, what year was that for you, Sneaky? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It it was super weird because it kept kind of just getting better and better um, in mm-hmm. terms of like results. Um, but you know, the total feeling of the team definitely felt the best chemistry with just the original C9. Um, and it's not like, you know, I was missing that the whole time as the rosters changed and whatnot, because I was still really good friends with everyone that came in. Um, like How many Jensen. splits did you guys play together, the original group? Uh, it was, so we did summer 2013, and then we did 2014 spring, 2014 summer, and then yeah. I th- think we changed after 2015 spring. Medios? It's like four, it's I like think four 20, years. I think 2015 summer was Jensen's first split. Yeah. 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 But you guys, you won the first two with like insane records. I remember you were mm-hmm. like 30 and three in the first split. And then you're like, you only had four losses in the second split or something. You were just yeah. nuts. So I think but then the wins kind of stopped. Four splits total. That's I like believe. four seasons for me, yeah. right? Yeah. And esports is like accelerated, right? Yeah, it's no, two yeah, years, no, but it's like, like four, four seasons. Season. And that's a lot of chemistry. That's a lot of uh, games where you find your way through and you almost get to a level where you can you can communicate with your teammate without even saying anything. Mm. Like they know, you know each other that well. Yeah, it's interesting because you say that, but you won with similar rosters the three times that you won, but you said the second time is when things really started to click. What made it click? Um, trust, mm. trust in our system, trust in uh, a focus of making each other better, serving each other, mm. and and it's hard. And it's been, sports and competition on teams you there's so much of an individual goal setting that goes on in the off season there's free agency there's money there's you know mvp desires there's scoring desires there's all these individual accolades that are a part of the game they're part of they filter in guys are tracking them guys are being measured by them fans are celebrating it or criticizing it all that stuff kind of goes into the individual assessment of how you feel about your play and your career as it's progressing throughout the course of a week, a season. And in the case of teams that kind of put, put that, put that in, a, in a jar, know that it's there, sit it on the counter, see it, but it isn't the most important thing, 
can get to that place you're talking about, that I'm talking about, that he experienced, mm. these guys have experienced. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And all of those, all of those accolades and all, of those, all the money and all the celebration comes. When you win, all that takes care of itself. But trusting that you can win by making that the least important thing is the hardest thing to do. Yeah. You mentioned the second year was the best one, even though you guys did win right after that. So do you feel like anything changed going from your second to third win? Uh, first one, we didn't know if we could do it. So there was something uh, special about, but also a little numbing about, did that just happen? <laughs> like, did we do it? Like, is this real? And very quickly you get, you get imposter syndrome after like two weeks of celebration, you go, oh no, like I'm gonna be found out that that was like a fluke. Like that, like we're really not that good. We kind of lucked up and that happened that way. And okay, now we got to prove it, right? Even yeah. after winning oh, the NBA, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because, because when, you, when you do it once, it, there's something that you can know it, because you know, the other side is going, oh, well you, you didn't do that. Well, you didn't cheat it or you didn't, you know, you say, we can say anything. Um, and the fans are like, well, let's see you do it again. And you know, the critics are like, let's see if you can do it again. And so <laughs> for us, it was, that second one for me was, we did it in, in, with such dominance that it was clear mm. that we were champions. Mm. And then- That probably makes the third one harder. It makes the third <laughs> one harder because not only are you fighting success, uh, because at that point, everyone's celebrating you unabashedly. They're, they're openly, you know, treating you like gods, right? And, and then you have to, again, put all of that in a jar, put it on the counter and focus on, okay, the legacy of it all. Yeah. And for us, it was about, we're good, no, we're great, but are we legendary? Yeah. Are we, are we gonna be remembered as, you know, how some of you guys remembered, right? Like, mm. you, built some, you, you built a foundation of an era of excellence. And that's what the push was on the third one. It's like, could we actually get there? And I wish we had had an example of four in a row, we had Phil Jackson, who was good at doing three in a row. <laughs> three, and then he takes a break, and he does another three, it's, it's and he takes a break. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we didn't get the string. We tried to get the string four together, but as you guys know, man, keeping a level of excellence that high for that long yeah. is stressful, right? It's draining. Years. It's draining. You uh, need a breath. You need a break. It's something that might seem off topic, but I want to kind of loop it back in. Um, I kind of look at Sneaky as a bit of a glue player. Yeah. Like, uh, especially when you talk about after you win, uh, it's hard to keep teams together in the off season because of accolades or wanting to get individual stats. For for you, Rick, with like off season incentives, I almost feel like if you were in the league today, you would be more valued as a player because three and D guys are so big. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of what you were on the Lakers, right? You're yeah. this defensive stopper, and you you shot yeah. threes to go with the superstars. I, I played the game with the intent to not only understand the entirety of what was happening. So that, like, to what you point out mm -hmm. with Sneaky, right? I had a pulse. That type of player is so the entire, valuable. Yeah, and those moments of team fights and those moments uh, where, I, where a glue guy, which I was known to be, mm -hmm. needed to step in and plug a hole or, mm -hmm. be, or raise the level of be, uh, to be a superstar or just step back and let's mm -hmm. like, support someone else. That's a level of confidence that comes with guys that, that are confident enough that whether they're celebrated or not, it's not about that. It's about are we gonna win today? I, I really like that. What led you to that mindset? Right, I was in Boston. I was a Celtic, I was a captain. I was scoring the most points on the team. We were losing. <laughs> and that sucked. <laughs> like I'm telling you, that sucked. I come to ball, I, I make a choice to come to LA, right? I could have stayed in Boston, been an all-star, made a lot of money, lost for another six years. Right? <laughs> or I could make the choice to come in and blend with, with other excellent players. And a lot of people don't know, I was a captain of those championship teams with Shaq and Kobe. I was like, mm. Phil grabs me and goes, okay, I got these two guys. I need someone that can hold this together that I can speak to. Because there's a lot of ego on it's those teams. There's a lot games. of ego. Yeah. See, I didn't, my ego, I checked that at the door when I came to LA mm -hmm. because and every once in a while, in my first year or two, Shaq would say to me, yo, man, I need, I need you to score, man. Like, be in a game, he'd just come up to me like, I need you tonight. I'd drop 30. I mean, he'd be like, oh, 
I go, yeah, do I do this? <laughs> like, but I'm letting you and Kobe and other guys do this because I need to defend and I need to pass and I need to, you know, because we all have our roles, right? We all have to accept someone's got to be that. I, I will say like that that's definitely a huge problem, especially with young, really talented players. Yeah. And I think I, I can give a lot of credit to Tactical here because he came in in a situation where Doublelift had just left the team, right? right? And he's playing with Core JJ, who is this MVP, many people respect him as the best player in the LCS. Mm -hmm. I still think he's the best player in the LCS. Mm -hmm. But like, Tactical could have an amazing, incredible game. And then you'll watch the post game and they'll be like, player of the game goes to Core JJ because he just let Tactical be so good. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> my bad. That's, the, that's the branding. Yeah. Right? So he, he just like never got credit for anything. And there's no way that doesn't dig at a 20 year old kid. Yeah. So I think there was definitely a push at the start of this year, whether it wasn't super vocal or not, like he needed to prove yeah. that tactical was good. That's the Kobe mm. story. Mm. Like you had Shaq who was the guy, the face of the league, face of the Lakers, and in comes this 18, 19 year old kid, Kobe Bryant, who had his, his eyes set on being the best player ever to play the game. Yeah. So I don't know if tacticals goals are to that level or where they're at, but yeah. if you have a 20 year old kid that's pushing himself to be that, they want to be recognized and respected as quickly as possible. Yeah. yeah. And so when they're not, it only it only supercharges and revs mm -hmm. them even up more to mm -hmm. to to search for that approval and that validation. Right. It's one thing to get it from your peers. It's one thing to get it from your coach. Nothing. It's another thing to get it from outside. Right. Yeah. And uh, and that happens with young players. You're absolutely right. That's a tough challenge. We didn't get it right with Kobe. Yeah. When, I mean, when you look at what broke the Lakers down and up and out and ended it's it. It's crazy. Lot. You say you didn't get it right. We just three championships. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no. But, <laughs> right, well, right, come on. Been <laughs> right. we, we didn't get it right. It should have been six. Yeah. Seven. yeah. Sneaky at Medios. Did you guys feel like you had sort of expectations of what kind of player you would be or what legacy you wanted people to remember you by? When you guys were so early. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah like, <laughs> it, it went to my head a little bit because I think I did get a lot of the credit on the original Cloud9 that you was won, like- You won the MVP, right? I got the playoffs MVP for the first split because they didn't have a, a full split MVP at the time. Mm -hmm. I probably would have got it if yeah. there was one. For sure, yeah. Um, and so I think I got a lot of credit mm -hmm. for like what the whole team was doing. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I was, you know, like the reason we were winning. I think I was part of the reason we were winning. I think everyone was. But um, yeah, I think for me, it was just like a lot of not even like trying to prove myself or needing like a ton of validation. It was just like, I like playing games with my friends. Let's see how far we can go. But then once I started getting like a taste of the success and like, you know, the admiration, I think I had to learn how to deal with that. And, you know, like most people didn't get it right my first try. I think like it did go to my head a bit. And, you know, I would like go on Reddit, read all the comments like, yeah. oh, Meteos is so good, Meteos is so good. And I was like, yeah, I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that's, that's, the, happens, that's the trap. Man. That's yeah. the young player trap. Yeah. Um, well, someone told me, if you, believe, if you believe everything someone tells you that's good, then you have to believe everything they tell you when it's bad, right? Yeah, exactly. You're never as good as Do they not tell recommend. you and you're never <laughs> Do not recommend. It's, yeah. it's a roller coaster. It's not yeah. fun. Yeah. But it is a nice little high, right? <laughs> when you first experience either success or celebrity or whatever it's and people are kind of giving you that applause it's a thing the one thing you have to deal with when you retire there's no one walking around going like this all the time right <laughs> like hey where's my uh? <laughs> but it, uh, it is it is an adjustment but the sooner you go through it you learn right you learn how to tune out right both the positive and the negative and just focus in on the things that are most important see how is it for you because one thing that like I always really respected about you is your ability to like not have an ego when it comes to that sort of stuff. Like, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> like how, how does it not go to your head? When I joined the team, like it was such a different dynamic for me. Um, I definitely, you know, go back, going back to like the glue thing. Like I felt like I had such a different role to play within the team. Like I was around a bunch of people that were all older than me. Like, I mean, you know, not much. I mean, Lemon was older, but like Medios <laughs> is a year Lemon. on me. I think High is like two on me, maybe one. Um, I mean, those differences matter more when you're like early 20s though. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, I was 19 at the time. Yeah, because uh, we're, we're coming out of high school. It's yeah. like in yeah. high school, if someone's a year older than you, it's like they're That's just a big yeah, deal. <laughs> so out of your league. Like. <laughs> yeah, like I just kind of followed you guys. And I don't know, I, th I think that 
definitely just brought me back in terms of ego and keeping myself like in check. Like I never really felt the need to be like the star player. Like all I wanted to do was win because that's all that really matters is mm -hmm. how your team does. Like if you're doing really well and you're losing, like that feels so much worse. Like you were saying, yeah. it's just, it's not a real feeling. Like losing is not the end goal. It's like you want to do anything you can to win, not anything you can to look good. Yeah. I think that's a hard mindset in the League of Legends pro scene because if you think about, so you grew up, I assume, playing basketball most of your life. I started at 15, I started late. Oh, I'm, a late, late I'm a late bloomer in general. Okay, well you bloom pretty hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, Once but, I get it, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you got it pretty good. Uh, but in with League of Legends, it's like you play basically the game as an individual game and then you go pro, right? Yes. And so I think your mindset around it, Sneaky, of I'm just gonna do what allows us to win, is kind, it seems to be a bit of a rarity. Like solo queue is not team first at all. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so, you don't start a solo queue conversation with me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, we got time. It's you the, still it's playing? The thing that's no, we probably, got time. It's the thing that's probably the most frustrating for me when I've been in solo queue or I've tried to climb is that I've tried in those ranks, actually those ranks, the only ranks I've kind of lived in, iron and bronze, is that, <laughs> is that I've tried to get, you know, whoever I queue up with, and I, and I was, I was intent on just queuing up with oh, no. randoms. You just tried because, to create teamwork. Yeah, I had to yeah. try to create the uh -huh. teamwork uh -huh. among. So then, you know, as soon as you queue up, I try to get on the comms. Anybody, anybody there? <laughs> yeah. like, can we talk about You're this? You're that like, guy. I'm that guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm that guy. We have a conversation before, before we start. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then I had friends. What are you doing? Did you ever say like, hey, I'm Rick <laughs> Fox. Yeah. Join me. <laughs> I did maybe twice. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't received well. Because then it was just like, oh, you think you know what you're doing? Like, uh, you know, it's just, but for me, I'm, I'm that. I think those 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 individuals in solo queue. And then and look, you, as you rise, you will find. I've seen it because I go and watch other people. Right? I go, is, is there some actual sense about working together at the higher levels? Yeah, right. But there's also a hard line about you better know how to read the game, pick up the game, read the tempo, all that stuff. And you get there through the solo queue climb. You learn those things. Mm. But it's hard to teach it in the lower levels. But the players yeah. that get it, that become pros, I feel they figure it out. Mm. If all five people are giving to the team, then everyone benefits, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens when you have like that one or two players who gives nothing but takes everything? Yeah, that, that's a good question because I think it's the hardest thing to get a team to do, which is to communicate openly and honestly amongst themselves. But the same way uh, each of us like to be maybe shown appreciation, like someone might say, you might like to be shown appreciation, you might say, hey, give me money, or you might say, uh, take me out to lunch, or you might say, hey, buy me a car, or like, you know, like it doesn't matter, like, you know, like, but, someone, but, but if I show up and I say, hey, man, I bought you a car, and you're like, hey, man, I don't like cars, like, take, <laughs> take, take, me, take me to lunch, you know what I mean, like, or, or do something different, right? That same, that same uh, conversation works with what is selfish. Like, if I don't understand what you find selfish, I could do that thing 10 times over, drive you mad, mm. and think I'm doing the right thing, right? So much of that is not handled in teams where the clear communication about, hey man, look, here's the thing that drives me up the wall. I see this as selfish. Do you even know that that's selfish? Yeah. Mm. Look, I was, the reason I was the third captain was I was the guy that would stand up in the meetings and lose my mind in front of everybody. <laughs> Why? Because six years of, my first six years, we lost. And I knew every losing characteristic in action because I'd seen it and mm -hmm. experienced it. In some cases, did it myself, right? So when I sniffed it or smelled it in the Lakers, I could not, I could not allow it to go on for more than five seconds. Mm -hmm. I would jump up and I'd be like, that's losing behavior. <laughs> am, I, am I alone in this? I'm, I'm, am I, I'm not calling you a loser. I'm saying you're doing losing shit right now. So do, am I right? I are mean, you seeing the same yeah. thing? And I, I had all of us, we Get all had everyone to, else to join, I, like, in I join in on this because we're going to put this in the middle of the room and we're going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you a loser. Yeah because we all do losing things from time to time, mm -hmm. but are we in agreement that we need to stop that thing? Mm -hmm. And if the person fights that, see, it's harder for them to fight it when five of us are sitting around the table going like, no, yeah, that's, that's, we don't agree with that either. Like that's, you know, and, and, some, and that's hard. And when you're a younger player to accept four other guys or eight other guys pointing that out, 
then you feel judged or you feel you, you clam up, you close off, you feel, you know, you feel um, accused of uh, uh, somehow the losses. You, you've made me really curious about something. Yes. This, this relates to uh -huh. one of the things that I try to deal with coaching. Okay, so I was a new coach, right? Yeah. I, I'd obviously been in team sports and competitive environments before. Yeah. And everyone is going to have their own style of how they try mm -hmm. and solve conflict. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I feel like I did a lot of upon reflection is I tried to tank a lot of the conflict myself. Mm. So I'd hear, you know, I'd go talk to one player, they'd complain to me about this way. I would try and package that feedback and deliver it to the other player mm. because I didn't want animosity or bad feelings to build up too much in the team right. to create a bad thing. But then there's the flip side of that, of my words would have more impact if they actually came from that person. Yeah. So like, how does, <laughs> how do you bet, like, I mean, how did Phil Take balance me back, that? Like, do you, do you just, you need that smashing conflict? How do you decide when to have that smashing conflict? You ha well, first because of all, I think there's gotta be a mix. First of all, you always have to have that moment in a team. Yeah. I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong. Every season, every split, did you always have the moment where things bubbled up and exploded and there was a conversation, there was something that had to be worked out? Oh yeah, that definitely happens. It always happens, right? Yeah. But like how big? It, 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 the bigger the better. Yeah, no, I don't but mean I imagine that. like I mean NBA that. athletes are going to have a bigger explosion than well, women. But, but, <laughs> by the bigger the better, I mean, doesn't it's, it's for it's for the group inside the locker room yeah. to have, mm -hmm. not the outside, not the media, not the press, not the fans. It's for the it's for the group inside. Mm -hmm. And 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 you ask how Phil did it? Well, a if he had an issue with Kobe, mm -hmm. he was on Shaq. If he had an issue with Shaq, he was on Kobe because he needed them to because. Because he's showing through mm -hmm. you what he needs to see, yeah. right? And if he had an issue with both of them, he came through me. Right. And always in those situations, he never delivered, he never struck, the, he never lit the light. He never poured the fuel on the fire. Mm. He hit the pilot light over here and he let you squeeze the fire and then you guys got sat in the fire and burned up in the conversation. So he'd have the team fight. The team, it, ha it always had to come, the vo a player on the team, someone of a voice, yeah. had to always put their foot down. Mm -hmm. Enough. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about this, mm -hmm. that's right? Who, that's and he would huh. sit back and watch it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's important, to, the patience to allow it to bubble up because a, a coach's job, right, is to keep things moving and and yeah. and, and, and sink and get win the, the wins, win, get the sure. win, because we're judging. Yeah. Phil, he didn't care if we lost 10 games. The first <laughs> 20 games of the season, it was always like, what are you guys up to? But then you need Would the buy-in from the bus family yeah. to be like, it's okay that you're losing 10 or 20 games. Did it ever piss you off if you had an issue about a teammate's behavior and Phil wasn't dealing with it? Because that can happen. Like yeah. the players, I'm sure they go yes. to Phil and be like, Phil, what the? But, right. Oh, but we then all he the just time. he just like sits back and just waits. Yeah, he, he, oh, it's a muscle man. Like, <laughs> but, he, but Phil also had what eight championships it on helps. his finger. Yeah, it helps when you have eight yeah. championships. To your point, the backing of the bus. The, like so, Phil. Phil, I'm sure Phil waited a lot less, a, sh a lot shorter amount of time when he first With started coaching the bus yeah, yeah. than when he had six rings. But there's a there's a trust in the process that he got to that he realized this is gonna happen at some point. If, if you got an issue with that player and you got an issue with that player, him fixing it is not gonna actually fix it. Mm. Yeah. It's the, it, yeah, it's Yeah, just a band-aid. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So how did that work? Because you, yeah. you were a pro for seven years. Yeah. How, how does this conversation rate? To I, no, I mean, it, it totally reflects. I mean, like there are always times, I mean, me, me and media has had some, you know, arguments with ourselves. Um, but it's, yeah, I think it is a lot of just being able to talk to the other player. It's healthy. It, it's just so necessary. Mm -hmm. like, the you get to it, the, the, it's, it's it is. the thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you can have the medium of the coach, but like he's saying, it's not going to fix it totally. No. It, exactly, because I, I feel like the emotions aren't going anywhere. And what oh, happens a lot of times nowadays is like, everyone is afraid of being dubbed like the toxic player, right? Right. Because, you know, as soon as you get a reputation for being toxic, like, uh, for example, there was like breaking point with Dardock, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, it wasn't great, but 
to act like he's the only person who's ever had like a bad attitude sometimes is like also not totally true. Give me the feet of the feet. If you ain't room for me, look how I went with the team. Some of y'all hated to see. All of the popping, all of the copping, talking, we shopping the spree. Be where I wanted to be. I came from nothing to king, king, yeah, I go. It's interesting, you talked about that thud when you knew that your career is over. Yeah. I'm curious to hear from you two. Like, do you guys consider yourselves retired? Um, yeah, it's it's weird for sure, because like I'm not old, right? No. <laughs> yeah. And like I still play the game. Um, I'm just not practicing it 24-7. You know, you you do scrims like eight, nine hours a day, and then you play yeah. solo queue. Like I'm not doing that schedule, but still playing games. So I, I don't know, like I definitely don't think I'm retired and I mean, maybe just from like competitive league, right? How much do you miss? It sounds like you don't miss the grind, but do you miss the competition and like winning? Yeah, you know, actually seeing uh, C9 qualify yesterday um, did bring back some memories. Like mainly when I saw them all behind uh, Sven on the analyst desk, mm -hmm. like they did a little interview with him. They all came up behind him. I'm like, damn, actually, I do remember how good it feels yeah. to like complete something as a team. Like. Yeah going through all the struggles, like they had to go through the loser's bracket. Like it was questionable, like whether they would make it or not. And then they actually made it through and it's like, damn, like that, I do remember that feeling and it feels super good. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just the competitive thing in general, yeah. being able to prove yourself. Yeah. Maybe one day, you know, me and Sneaky will join a team. We'll win <laughs> a few more championships. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, I'm just, you know, open to other stuff too. I think it's a mindset. I think retirement yeah. is a mindset mm. more than a physical, more than physicality. Because mm -hmm. guys can come back, we've seen it a lot, right? For me, retirement meant mentally releasing myself of that, um, that focus and desire and, and preparation that, that I'd been on for 20 years. Like, mm. like I never stopped thinking about the game when I was in the game. Mm -hmm. And um, now I can think about the game from a joyful place of just as a fan, you know? And I can still analyze it, I can still look at it and think, but I physically may not be able to do it the same way. But when I retired, I retired mentally, because if, if I didn't turn that off, I would, I would make the attempt to come back, mm. yeah. Yeah. you know? And for me, the, the, the coming back meant putting my body at risk for the rest of my life. You said you're always thinking about the game, but could you unplug like in the off season? Could you take two months when you had three days between games? Was there ever a day where you weren't playing? Uh, you, you know, said take two months. Well, off season <laughs> of two months, like you take a day, no. right? Like, is I your mean, mind is it the same level of load? Or I don't is it know about you guys, but for me, it was always on. Yeah, like I, because there's a there is a level of this sense that people are coming for my job. Yeah, like there's yeah. like someone's coming. Some if I'm not doing it, someone else is doing it. Yep. And even though I'm told I'm supposed to like stop and put down the basketball, like I don't think I stopped and put down a basketball for a week or two in my life as an NBA player or a basketball player until, until I had surgery okay. and I was forced to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even then I still was swimming in the pool. I was still physically still trying. working out all the yeah, time. Yeah, I was still thinking about, you know, the, the game, the season. Like it's just something that that when you get, when you, when you want to stay in front of the competition or you feel like, hey, you know, I'm getting older and things aren't as easy or I, or I had to improve in this area, mm -hmm. it's, it's always there. It's like, a, it's like a treadmill that's always on. If you're playing at a championship level, yeah. you're locked in the whole time. The whole time, yeah. Like, Makes sense. And it's unhealthy. It's mm -hmm. super unhealthy mm -hmm. to be that obsessed. Yeah. Mm. But it is that... Thing, that different, differentiating thing Can that be. you see yeah. in that player that you go, aha, that guy. Yeah, and, and you can. I, what, I, what, I, what I was going to say um, was I think in my early days, like when we were on C9, it, it did kind of feel like that where we grinded nonstop, but it never felt like an effort. And it, I, I imagine it's the same for like yourself and most other people is like, I never once felt like I was forcing myself to play. And I think that's what happens to a lot of players, and it's you know kind of like the idea of burnout. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a tough thing because you really need that passion if you want to be the best. Because 
At some mm -hmm. level, it is just, you know, how much time are you putting in? Are, are you putting in more energy, more time than the next guy? Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think it's something you can manufacture. I don't think you can force yourself to do it or that will just destroy you. But I think that, you know, the people who really have that passion, they don't need to force it. It's just completely natural. It's like you don't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Rick, I'm curious from your perspective as someone who's run a team before, when you were running Echo Fox, did you feel like there was a big difference in how much you cared about getting to Worlds versus winning NA? Everything was about winning NA for us. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was. And because we were building, we're building an org, we're building a culture of winning. And we obviously, our first season, we were one in 17. Like we were horrible, right? <laughs> and we were, we were the laughing stock of the league, but um, we knew what it felt like. We knew how painful that was. We didn't get relegated, which was for me, one of the most memorable journeys in a, in a season for us was to find our way through that and to actually salvage a, 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 you know, being a part of the league that year. Mm. Uh, but as we kept trying to find out how to win and how to learn from the, those that knew how, you need, to, you need to be able to win the Western Conference Finals before you can go to the finals. Like you need to be able, like you have to have a, a feeling of accomplishment. And for us, it was, could we just win a split? Like the year we, we actually just found ourselves in Miami competing for the spring split, you know, championship, like we, that was amazing. We came in third, but still, it was just like, mm -hmm. we're like, we're, we're actually now in the game. Mm. Like we're in the conversation of, of even possibly hanging a banner in that, in that, you know, that arena back there. You know, I, I walked through there, and that was every time I'd sit in the stands, it was like, man, someday, just want to hang in that banner to begin with, you know, because yeah. you see all the greats that have done it, right? And it didn't. It just points to a sense of we're on the right track. We are champions even in our own region. We can represent you know, our country and our region and the world. It would be great. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, to that point, you know, it's, the ultimate is winning the worlds, but you kind of have to, you got to you gotta win each stage to get there, you know? Yep. Yeah. One day. Yeah. For NA. <laughs> <laughs> so we have C9 TL 100. Yeah. What do we think this, a, me, a win this weekend would mean for their legacies respectively? Starting with Sneaky. <laughs> I mean, it would be pretty insane for C9, just considering they won spring. Yeah. And, you know, going from last year, they won spring and just completely fell off in summer. Like, they were on, like, a nine-game win streak or something, and they just started losing everything. Uh, that was disastrous. But now it's like they actually made Worlds again. They're still in the running for playoffs. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it'd be nuts for them. I don't know about the other teams. Yeah, I mean, one of our goals was to win a trophy for Barney and for Eddie. Mm. Because as experienced as the team is, like, Alfari's never won a domestic title, neither is tactical. And Santorin hasn't won since 2015. So I think individually for those guys, even though the ultimate goal is to win Worlds, like, I think that's more where Jensen and Coors heads are going to be at. But for those three, like, the domestic title is really, really meaningful for them mm. to have, to win, right? To not just be a good player, but to win uh, a, a domestic title. So... I think they're really motivated, so I think it'll mean a lot to them. 100 Thieves. Yeah, I was going to say, what is 100 Thieves? <laughs> yeah. thieves. Winning the first title in their org's history has to mean something. Yeah. Right? They've, they've been to finals before. They got swept. Uh, they went to Worlds. Didn't go well. Right? So going back to Worlds is obviously a huge accomplishment for them. That they've already, like, it's a milestone they've already reached. But winning an A, I think... I think it should be really meaningful if they're able to, to run the table and win it. Yeah, and look at all the changes they made for summer, right? They brought in Reaper, they brought in Abadaga. Mm -hmm. Going into the year, they're, after the play-in, they're considered like a contender and then it started to fall apart. So mm -hmm. I agree, it would be a really big deal for them too. Okay, who you guys got? Who do you think is gonna win? Oof. Predictions. Predictions. I feel Predictions. like if you're making a prediction, you have to bet TL, because... Okay. If you bet any other team, they have to win two series. TL just has to win one. Yeah. So we got the math take. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I'll go with the Thieves only because they haven't done it before. Okay. And I have a mad respect for the, for the big four. Um, but as a team that was trying to break in, mm. I, mm. I, I can root for a team that needs to crack in, you know, and, and, and shake it up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that no one said C9, even though they're the defending champs. Is it you? No. <laughs> yeah. I think it's TL. I actually thought it was going to be TL in spring, and then 
you know, everything happened with Santorin. Yeah. And, yeah. But I, I thought they were going to be the strongest in spring. I expected them to be strong in summer. I gave up on them a little bit mid-split when, you know, they were, but all this change. <laughs> uh, but I think they're the strongest. I think, for me, it's a, a question of, is C9 going to hit their peak again? Because mm -hmm. I think peak C9... It's really close between peak C9 and peak TL, and I think peak 100 is probably below both of those. But I don't know. Sneaky, do you, are you a C9 believer? Do you have anyone? I mean, based on the more recent happenings, it looks like a TL win, but I, I could see C9 actually coming out of that you know, lower bracket, best of five. They can get more comfortable, get more games in. Mm. TL's just sitting by, waiting, getting rusty. <laughs> C9 does have the advantage now of the perks buff where he cannot get eliminated. Mm. <laughs> he he can passing. only peak when he's on the cusp of being eliminated. When, when he needs one, to win. Yeah. He can't tap into that unless he actually needs to win. So I fully expect C9 to be down two games in any series they're in and then <laughs> just still probably win. Yeah, I go, put him up, put him up. Yeah, I go, put him up, put him up. That was Dean. This is now. This was so. Let them know. Yeah, I go, put him up, put him up. Yeah, I go, put him up, put him up. That was them. This is me.